Another study that Lapworth did was he studied graptolites, and he realized the significance of these, really these guide or index fossils. Uh, graptolites are planktonic organisms. They're actually, uh, they're called hemichordates, so they're sort of related to vertebrate organisms. And each of these little stems contains maybe about 100 little individuals. They live in these little cups. Uh, you can sort of make out these little cups in here. The little, those little cups are called feca. So the feca is a cup, and inside the little cup lives an individual. And they're planktonic. These guys float around the ocean. So, so they're, they're distinctive. When you see these, you can recognize them right away. Uh, they have a widespread distribution, and they lived over a relatively short period of time. So they're, they're really good index fossils or guide fossils. But he used these to determine some of the geology in Scotland. And if you look at some of the mountain ranges in Scotland, the Scottish Highlands, it's folded and faulted. And, and he realized that there are a series of thrust faults and folding because he would keep seeing these same fossils appear again and again and realize that the, the whole sequence of rocks were stacked upon each other through some compressionary compressionary. Uh, event or some convergent margin that kind of thrusts these uh, rock units over one another. But anyhow, um, in this chapter, he's really just described as the guy who, who named the Ordovician, but he had a lot more to do with recognizing fossil guide fossils and, and how they can be used in deciphering structural problems like this. Now, going back and looking at some important classifications. So for the lithostratigraphic units, uh, the, the base unit is the formation. Uh, but you can see that, that formations could be parts of groups. Uh, remember we talked about the Uncar group in the Grand Canyon or the Tonto group in the Grand Canyon. And then there could even be supergroups, which are even larger groups than that. But, but the formation is a base unit. And then formations can be broken down into members and there could be individual beds, like a marker bed within those members or that formation. So those are the lithostratigraphic, solely based on the rock type. For the biostratigraphic units, so these are based on fossils. And the, the unit here, we look at the biozone. And that biozone could be a fossil assemblage, like, like a series of graptolites or brachiopods or, or trilobites that are all kind of living together in the same period of time. And we can use that as a biostratigraphic marker. And then for uh, expressing units of time, we look at the time stratigraphic, stratigraphic units. And so these terms, RFM system series, they're kind of old terms from the 1800s. We don't really use these anymore. So when we're looking at the time units, we're really looking at the eon, the era, the period, the epoch, and the age. So these are the ones we use mostly. But, but originally, these systems were, were rock units that were the stratotype, the type location, the stratotype for that particular system. For, for example, the Devonian system. Well, the, the stratotype for the Devonian system is in Devonshire in England. For, the, for Cambrian is in South Wales in England. And that would be the, the, the stratotype for that system. But now we recognize the Cambrian as occurring everywhere. And so we, we just call it the Cambrian period. And any rock units that fall within that Cambrian period would be part of that system as well. So mostly we use the time units. We really don't use these terms that much anymore. Let's look at these lithostratigraphic units in a, in a bit more detail. So again, these units are defined by rock types. And the base unit is the formation. Formations are mappable bodies of rock with distinctive upper and lower boundaries. So there's a bedding plane that separates it from adjacent, subjacent or superjacent formations. So they can include igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks. And then again, remember we could divide these into members and individual beds or even broader groups or supergroups. Here's a representation of units in Capitol Reef over in Utah, Capitol Reef um, National Park. And so here we have uh, the geologic time units, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Paleocene. And then we're also looking at the rock formation. So the main formations, the main unit here of the lithostratigraphic unit would be in this case the Manco Shale, the Morrison Formation, or the Chinle Formation. But then we can see that there's other formations like the Somerville Formation, Curtis Formation, Entrada Sandstone, which is over at um, Arches National Park, Chinle Formation. So these units or formations belong to a group called the San Rafael Group. And then a little bit older than that, in the lower Jurassic end of the Triassic, 
we'll see the Wingate Sandstone, Cayenta Formation, Navajo Sandstone. So those become are part of this Glen Canyon group. So you see there's groups here, formations, right? And then if you look at the Morrison, the Morrison separate into the Tidwell member, salt wash member, brushy basin member. So remember the Morrison late Jurassic is very famous for its dinosaur fossils, especially the, the uh, sauropod fossils, uh, long neck dinosaurs. Now looking at the biostratigraphic units, so this one was really based on fossil. And the basic unit here would be the biozone. Biozone boundaries do not necessarily correspond to lithostratigraphic units. One thing that, that we talk about is rock units can be time transgressive. So what that means is that, for example, the, the top eight sandstones in Arizona, there's an equivalent lithostratigraphic unit up near Wisconsin that documents the same transgression that the sock sequence that, that flooded most of the North American continent during the early Paleozoic time. But the rock units up in Wisconsin, those sandstones that are equivalent to the top eight sandstone in Arizona, well, in Arizona, they're lower Cambrian. In Wisconsin, they're upper Cambrian to Ordovician. So again, that's they're spanning time, two different geologic, same rock, but spanning two different rock, uh, uh, geologic time systems. Now, when we look at the chronostratigraphic units, uh, time stratigraphic units, here we're looking at geologic time. So remember, a chronostratigraphic unit units define a particular rock body formed during a particular interval of time. And the, the base unit here is the system, the basic unit for the chronostratigraphic uh, uh, units. And so remember I talked about the stratotype. It's a sequence of rock bodies in a given area where the system was first described. So the stratotype for the for the Devonian was in Devonshire. The stratotype for the Cambrian was in South Wales in, in England, right? So fossils can be used to identify a system beyond its stratotype. So now recognizing fossils, especially what Murchison did because he described the, the Silurian fossils so well of Southern England, we can use those fossils to go beyond the stratotype and, and name Silurian rocks in other countries or in even other continents. So expressing uh, these chronostratigraphic units in geologic time, so remember the time units designate specific intervals of time that are not tied to any bodies of rock or area. So time units have corresponding time stratigraphic units. So we talked about these, uh, the era, the eon, the periods already. And so those are the ones, the terms that we use most often. When we look at this idea of correlation, now we're trying to match rock types and particularly rock formations of equivalent age across large geographic regions. And when we do that, we, we do it based on lithostratigraphic correlation. So again, just looking at the rock type without regard to their age. So that's kind of the idea of this time transgressive unit, like I talked about the top eight sandstone in Arizona being the same unit as sandstones in Wisconsin, but, but they're spanning different geologic time period, time transgressive unit this lithostratigraphic correlation. Uh, but when we're looking at correlating the same units in terms of time, that would be a time stratigraphic correlation. So systems may be correlated beyond their stratotypes by applying the principle of fossil successions. So that would just be looking at the fossils. And so in one area, you may have um, a, a limestone facies and a sandstone facies formed at the same time in two different environments, but they may be collecting the same fossils. So those two units, even though they're two different rock types, they would still be time stratigraphic correlated because they they were formed during the same interval of geologic time. So and here is a good example of a lithostratic correlation where we're looking at the Cedar Mesa sandstone. We can match that right across. There's a Oregon rock shale at the top here. We can match that across, and the Hal Halgado shale at the bottom here. We can match that across. So that's just matching rock units straight across. And so we talked a little bit about these in the last talk. So remember, range zone it describes a biozone, a geologic grain, in terms of the fossil or fossil groups. And then remember, we use concurrent range zones to establish overlapping ranges of two or more fossils to give us uh, the age of a particular rock body, right? In terms of time stratigraphic correlation, we can use some short duration physical events. Some physical events of short duration can demonstrate time equivalence between two or more widely separated rock bodies. 
examples are lava flows or volcanic ash. And really the volcanic ash, because the volcanic ash, when it erupts, especially the fallout ash, will spread along over a wide area of the countryside uh, or maybe an area of several hundred kilometers and really blanket the landscape in one unit of time. And we call that tephra chronology. So a tephra is any pyroclastic exploded ash material that comes out of the volcano. And that marks a horizon in time. And we can, if we can date that rock with radiometric age dating techniques because the minerals crystallize from the magma so they, they have an atomic clock, we can get the age or constraint of that, of that rock. And then we can tell something about the sedimentary rock units that are either below or above that unit. Now, um, this works well with Phanerozoic age rocks. So in this case here, we have volcanic ash that occurs. We can date this ash, and we find that same ash in a different area, maybe several hundred kilometers away, but we can correlate that. And then we can say, well, the units below this ash are going to be older than whatever age this, this ash bed is. Uh, and the units above it are going to be younger. And what's nice if we can find another ash bed, and now if we can date this ash, let's say we date the older one at 20 million years, we did th date this one at 15 million years, then we know that the rocks between the two ash beds are anywhere between 20 and 15 million years old. They fit, fit in this range here, right? So that'll give us uh, a way to put a numerical age on the relative dating that we're looking at here. So we talked about glauconite already. Remember, uh, glauconite, because argon is a gas, it can escape pretty easily from the, uh, from the sediment. And glauconite does form, this word authogenic means it forms in place. Uh, usually in marine rocks that have low oxygen concentration. But again, we're looking at that argon loss. So we really only get a minimum age for whatever the sedimentary rock unit. So really it's best to use either sills, dikes, anything that has a cross-cutting relationships, volcanic ash, ash beds, lava flows, and whatnot. That's the best way to constrain the ages of sedimentary rocks. And so in this picture here, uh, here we have a lava flow that's been dated at 18 million years, a baffle that's an intrusion that's 12 million years, here's an ash fall at 8 million years, and a dike at 5 million years. So just by looking at this, at this limestone and sandstone, we know that the the limestone and sandstone have to be younger than the ash fall, so it's, so it's younger than 8 million years. But the fact that these two units are cut by the dike that's 5 million years old, then we know that the, the limestone and sandstone is, is anywhere between 5 and 8 million years old of age. So that's when we, when we can constrain the ages of sediment formations is by looking at igneous units here.